Welcome, Greek U Nation, to episode number 338 of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Eilon, CEO of Greek University. I'm a speaker and an author. Our third book is called From Letters to Leaders, Leveraging Your Fraternity or Sorority Experience to Land Your Dream Job, which launched on Amazon a couple of months ago. So go and pick up that book today. We call these episodes the Fraternity Foodie Podcast because there is nothing like great food to bring college students together. Fun fact, there is a history of pranks, or as they call it, hacks at MIT, that are very extensive with homages to pop culture, nods to charity, and lots of digs at Harvard as well. The Great Dome of MIT's Building 10 has been the site of many of these pranks, including most notably the stationing of a fake MIT police car on top of the dome in 1994. Its visible location along the Charles River and its size and scale making a very intriguing pedestal. And nobody really knows how they got the car up there. It took a crane to remove the car from the top of the dome. Amazing stuff. Our next guest is Dr. Stuart Lichtman. Stuart is an executive entrepreneur, a researcher, consultant, trainer, and coach. He's also the creator of the Arntel Artificial Intelligence Data Analysis Program. He's president of Partners in Excellent Inc. and president of Successful Ventures Publishing Inc. Stuart's formal education includes undergraduate and graduate work at MIT in engineering, psychology, and artificial intelligence. He also has master's work in applied psychology and doctoral work in organization development and cross-cultural business. He has also conducted extensive research of the unconscious and intuitive basis of success and the individual and collective operation of the human mind. Stewart has directed or run 100 companies, and he's trained more than 75,000 people all around the world. Welcome to the show, Stuart. I'm Michael. How are you? I am doing great. It is a pleasure to be here with you today. I am just so excited to talk to you a little bit more about cybernetic transposition and uh, the author of your book. I mean, it's just amazing stuff that you've done here. Um, let's go back to the undergraduate work. I think this is kind of interesting because you had many choices, I'm sure, in terms of where you were going to go to school for college. So I'm wondering what made you decide that MIT was the right place for you? This is, you're going to really laugh at this. Okay. My brother, my brother went to Harvard. He's two years older. Yeah. As I've told you, I have the Asperger's, which I didn't connect with anybody at that point. <clears throat> and the only person I knew was my brother. I didn't want to be too far from him. So we're just down, you know, MIT is a factory down the road from Harvard. It also has a chocolate factory. And you talk about pranks. What our prank was in the winter, you know, the 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 townies in Cambridge really don't like the college students. They're really resentful, so they would come in and plow the uh, streets so as to just bury the cars that were parked there. We got a little pissed off. So what we did was to get some telephone poles and put them in the middle of the road under the snow. Uh, it was interesting to watch the cranes bouncing off them. <laughs> That's an easy way to, to destroy some equipment. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what, it's unbelievable. How could the people in Cambridge be opposed to the students? I mean, think about all the business that you're bringing to Cambridge. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. But uh, <laughs> they don't really see it that way. Well, they're missing the boat. They don't understand economics. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. So, all right. So you mentioned it. I mean, you've been blessed with Asperger's syndrome your whole life. How has that actually helped you to rapidly see through to the heart of a matter? Well, it started out as a curse when I was a kid. I didn't connect with anybody, my parents, my brother. I couldn't connect with anyone. It's a very lonely existence. Mm -hmm. Then at a certain point, when I was about 28, I had a near-death experience. I met God. I was dead for eight minutes clinically, which you're not supposed to be able to come back from. And 
I came out of it knowing stuff I shouldn't know. Uh, I just give you an example. Uh, first consulting job I took after that was a Mennonite uh, family company in Pennsylvania. And it was in trouble. So I sat down with the president. I said, what's going on? After five minutes, I said, okay, here's what's going on. Here's the problem. So I just knew it was an inner knowing. And I was right. He looked at me and said, how do you know that? And, you know, I did that with the other key figures. And in a month, we had the problem solved. Um, basically, my gift is uh, seeing to the essence of something, the core, um, like how to save the world, yeah. which is my present challenging objective. I would say so. That's a very challenging objective. And you know what? Listen, we all have issues. Every single one of us, you know, the question is, how do we use what God gave us to try to make this world a better place? And uh, you clearly have been able to do that. You're the developer of cybernetic transposition and the author of the book. It's called Make Your Life a 10, How to Successfully Do, Have, or Be Anything You Want. So talk to our audience a little bit about the three steps of cybernetic transposition and how will that help me to accomplish seemingly impossible things? Okay. Conceptually, it's very simple. In order to do seemingly impossible things, step number one is to create a target in your unconscious because the unconscious does all the doing. And a target that is accepted by the unconscious and conscious mind. Now, you know you got the right kind of a target if intellectually, mentally, consciously, it's right for you. And intuitively, it's right and exciting and wow. So that's the kind of target. The second thing you have to do is to prioritize the target in the unconscious, because the unconscious is doing millions of things at once, not the least of which is keeping you alive. And so um, one way of prioritizing it is what we all did when we were in high school. We learned our lines for a school play by repetition and repetition and repetition. That's a hard way, a better way of doing it. But that's the way of a way of prioritizing it. So you knew you had it in your unconscious. You got your cue and the lines just rolled off. You didn't consciously try to do it. The third thing, and the one that is most ignored, is that you have to resolve the self-defeating unconscious habit patterns. I call them blockers. That would prevent you from getting there. Now, a blocker is something that seems like, well, common ones are like confusion, fatigue, um, upset, anguish, feeling unworthy, blah, blah, blah. Anything other than loving, joy, acceptance, and enthusiasm is probably a blocker. That means we spend a lot of our time being run by blockers, because blockers are in the unconscious. They run us without our conscious knowledge. We just know the results. So you do those three things properly, and well, in my training, 100% uh, of the people for the past 10 years have achieved their first seemingly impossible objective on the first try, assuming they did the assigned work. Wow, that is absolutely incredible. All right, so you've told us what some of the examples of blockers are, but for everybody, you know, the blockers are different. I mean, you just cycled through maybe, you know, seven or eight of them. How do you identify these blockers? Well, it's easy. 
they get in the way. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, have you ever had a day when you're feeling really great, everything's wonderful, and you come home and your partner or your sibling or whatever is kind of pissed off and suddenly you start feeling pissed off. <laughs> okay. What happened was their anger, their pissed offness was psychically broadcast. Whenever we have strong emotions, we psychically broadcast them. And if you have a part of the unconscious that resonates with that, you pick up what they're feeling, that blocker, and suddenly you don't feel good anymore. You're pissed off. <laughs> That's probably happened once or twice with my wife and I. <laughs> yeah. so, so can you give us an exercise to change these blockers into something that would be a successful habit pattern? Well, in my book, I show you, uh, and it would be too time consuming. It takes about 15 or 20 minutes, but I can give you a little workaround. Right. Take the situation you're in. Like, I don't understand what the hell this book means. So you take the feelings, the body feelings that accompany that experience and you put them into your heart chakra in center of your chest, which is where the unconscious pays a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. And you say, please take me back to earlier times. So you go back to five earlier times when this is present. And then you reframe those. You use your marvelous skill of hindsight, which is a much maligned, extremely good hit skill. And you change what really happened in your imagination to something exactly the way you would like it have been, to have been. And then you tell your unconscious, that's an example of the way I want to handle this kind of situation. You do that for all five things, and you then look at the essence of what these reframe what, and suddenly, if you do all the way I show in the book, you will never have that blocker feeling again. When that blocker would have come up, you will automatically have the reframed experience come up. Nice. I like that a lot. That's uh, that's really good. I'm going to have to give that a try. Now, you know, in terms of building success in life, I think we have to build successful people around us in order to elevate us to success. So how do you build a success team around you? Well, I have a process that I described in the book. May I talk about the book for a second? Please, yes. Okay, it is what I call the operating manual for the human mind that didn't come with us. And it teaches you a series of skills for managing the unconscious mind consciously. One of those is what I call the perfect partner process. You design a perfect partner, romantic partner, business partner, prospect you want to sell to, or whatever. And suddenly, when you've done it, they appear on the horizon. They're there. And if you watch, comparing what your list of desirable characteristics is, is with the people that show up in your life, suddenly within two or three weeks, you've got your perfect whatever. Cool. In my case, um, I hadn't been in a relationship for about 12 years. My both sons who had been living with me were in college and my birthday was coming up. So I set an objective to come up with a perfect partner. I had 32 characteristics, one of which was practically perfect in every way. You know, Mary Poppins. And about two days later, I was watching Law and Order on television. I'm a Law and Order freak. And my unconscious said to me, do that. I said, do what? 
and an ad for eHarmony came on. And I said something that wasn't at all polite, and it shut up. Next day, it hit me three times. Next day, it hit me five times. I said, okay, I'll do it, I'll do it. So they um, came up with the first three people. First two weren't really it. Then they came up with a woman with a picture like this. <laughs> this is her at the, in the Antarctic with baby penguins crawling on it. I said, this has got to be an interesting person. Oh, yeah. That's, she's been my wife for 17 years. She is practically perfect in every way. There are a few things. She beats me at gin too much of the time. <laughs> but we have a delightful life. It seems to get better every day. So you can bring into your life, you unconsciously, psychically draw them to you whether it's a prospect or a mentor. When I was in MIT, my first advisor screwed me. Um, I was kind of woo when I got into MIT. I looked at the catalog, I couldn't even understand the catalog. <laughs> um, anyway, I didn't think I had a good memory and um, and you have to take chemistry. Chemistry, from my point of view, is all memory. So I said to my advisor, look, can I take it next year? I'm having some trouble acclimating. He said, sure, no problem at all. He gave a sign off, gave me a slip. Two weeks before the end of finals, first semester, get called to the dean of the student's office. He says, I see you haven't taken any exams in chemistry. If you don't get at least a C in the final, you're out. I said, but, but, I advise him. He said, nah, he made a mistake. He didn't have a right to do that. So I found a uh, woman who became my first wife, who was really a whiz at chemistry. She's at Boston U. And she taught me enough in two weeks, so I got a C plus. <laughs> and then I went looking for another advisor. I designed one, and I got a fabulous one, probably the first person in my life who really cared about me. Um, and uh, Professor Dwight Bowman, he introduced me to the first venture capitalists in the world. He introduced me to the people who then the mini computer, which is, you know, it used to be three rooms for a computer. Mm -hmm. Mini computer was only about that big. And I knew them. A lot of the people who were at the beginning of the changes, I was one of the first people working in artificial intelligence. Um, in any case, I got a great advisor, and your people can do the same. Now, I'm going to plug my book because I've made it for everybody who wants to make their life for a 10, a 10, you start out by identifying the areas of your life that are a 10 and the areas that aren't. Most people, the total number that comes up is between eight and 16. And then the book teaches you how to fix them. So you might say, well, I'm going to graduate. I need to get a great job. Okay, here's how you set up the target. Here's how you achieve it. And suddenly you get your great job that you've designed. But don't forget, design a great boss, too. That's <laughs> part of the process. Okay. Um, when I was, when I graduated MIT, undergraduate, I immediately enrolled in grad school. My first wife had a um, different idea. We weren't having a really easy time of it. This is a time where women said, the way you fix a marriage is get pregnant. Well, she had a major job in presenting that from happening. And she stopped doing it. 
and she got pregnant. I had to quit school. Get a job. First job I got um, was at Honeywell in Newton, Mass, suburb mm -hmm. Boston. Uh, I come there. I'm introduced to my boss. I say, "What should I do?" He said to me, "You figured out. You're the smartest MIT guy." He obviously didn't want me, <laughs> and so I used my skill that I had from Asperger. They were making these high-speed printers, you know, the printers that print a uh, paper that wide mm -hmm. and have smeary type and so on. Mm -hmm. They're selling them for 35000 It cost them seventy to make. And so I talked to the engineers and I said, what's wrong? And they said, it's our suppliers. They are just we only have one supplier for the most part, and they're just reaming us. I said, why did he have, only have one supplier? And I got craziness. So my unconscious said, go to a piano store. So I did. You ever look inside a piano? It has this big, heavy cast iron frame, about that big in cross section, usually painted gold. That's what it takes to hold the strings in alignment. I looked at this high-speed printer, and it had this very pretty, very thin aluminum frame. And I said to my boss, this frame is waving in the breeze, I'll bet you. Well, those days, high technology was high-speed photography. So in the printer, what you do is you have a lot of electromagnets, firing 132 hammers at a combination of paper and drum with the characters on it. Kind of the analogy to uh, a regular, um, what can I say, typewriter. Mm -hmm. I, I just lost the image of you for some reason. That's In okay, case, I'm still here. In any case, um, so I said, okay, to fix this, we're doing our frame. He said, design it, I did. Printing quality went up, cost went down to 28,000, and I was a hero. Wow, that's incredible. Uh, and there was a group there, entrepreneurial, who wanted to spin out a company to make the kind of thing that I had invented. And so I felt very honored that they included me, not realizing that the reason they included me was they couldn't do the venture without including me. I learned my first lesson in entrepreneurship. The guy who was running the company was also supposedly chief salesman. He went out to companies, OEM companies that made big computers, and they would give him, offer him a sample order of 10 or 15 units. He wouldn't take anything under 100 units. Now, what? They think that he thought that companies were crazy. Here we got a startup company, and they're going to take 100 units at 28,000 apiece, or I think we're charging. 39. Um, anyway, the investors tried like hell to get him to see the light. And finally, one day they broke in, stole the prototype, all the design info, and the company was off. First lesson as an entrepreneur, do not piss off your investors. <laughs> That's good advice. <laughs> and, so what can I say? It um, It's interesting. Now, over, I ran a, a bunch of startup companies. Um, I got into real estate. I built a little mini empire. It was four subdivisions and a garden apartment project. 
spread around the Washington, D.C. area. I was too dumb to know that there are these real estate cycles. Every 10 or 15 years, the real estate market collapses. Mm -hmm. And the longer the time, the worse the collapse. Everybody else knew about it. I didn't. So it collapsed. Um, I went bankrupt. Nothing like seeing the sheriff come and put a uh, sign on the door of your house. So long. Oh. Um, I was so depressed, I tried committing suicide, which was a brilliant act on my part because I met God. And shortly thereafter, meditating two hours a day to keep the, up the contact, God gave me what I teach as cybernetic transposition. I wrote, I was writing, he told me to write down, I wrote it down. I ended up with three thick, narrow lined uh, legal paths. And then being an entrepreneur, I said, I know this will work. So I put together training 250 people. And that training was the first shot. So only 67% achieved their perfectly seemingly impossible objective on the first try. Second time, it was up to 80%. Now it's 100%. Um, so my job was making it operational. God's job was giving me the information. And that's continued since then. Fantastic. That is just incredible. Well, thank you so much for sharing everything. Uh, I mean, it's just uh, incredible. I think our college students who are listening right now, they've taken a lot from it. Um, and make sure you go out and pick up the book. It's called Make Your Life a 10, How to Successfully Do Have or Be Anything You Want. So that's just an incredible book. And uh, just I thank you so much for sharing your story. So if the college students who are listening right now if they want to bring you in to speak on their college campus, if they want to go out and buy your book, where should they go in order to get all of this? Well, well to get in touch with me, just send me an email. All right. My email address is basically my first two initials and my last name. S.A. Lichtman, L-I-C-H-T-N-A-N, at gmail.com. And... Please keep your email rather short and in short paragraphs with white between them makes it much easier for me to read. I'll get back to you real quick. If you want to buy the book, just go to Amazon. Make your life a 10. That's the number 10. And you find it there. Um, it's been up, I don't know, it's been up for a couple of months. And I have some nice uh, testimonials, uh, particularly nice one from Jack Canfield. And uh, it basically shows you how to do things. Now, there is, at the end of the intro, a link, that is, you'll have to key it in, where you can get a package of a complete audio book, a um, series of 15 applications of the basic techniques included in the book, such as finding your perfect partner or completing your work in half the time with better results and so forth. Uh, and there are a series of guided audios to walk you through learning some of the processes described in the book. Book's only 18 bucks. I sold the $6 million worth of an earlier version of the book that I sold for $97. I really want to get this out. I think it can really help you, particularly you guys who are in college. You're looking at a rough job market. Let me tell you, do what's in the book, I need a perfect job, and 
you have almost 100% chance of getting what you want very quickly. That sounds good. So as long as you do the assignment, you can get what you want, including the perfect job. I mean, what's better than that? Go and pick up the book. It's called Make Your Life a 10, How to Successfully Do, Have, or Be Anything You Want. Thank you so much, Dr. Lichtman, for spending time with us today. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for giving me a chance to spend time chatting with you. Of course. Of course, it's our pleasure. And to our listeners, if you enjoyed this talk with Dr. Stuart Lickman, make sure that you like it and share it on social media. Go and pick up his book on Amazon. And we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.